Leading Ideas Talks podcast is brought to you by the Lewis Center for Church Leadership of Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. Subscribe free to our weekly e-newsletter, Leading Ideas, at churchleadership.com slash leading ideas. Learn strategies to identify and support new leaders and build and maintain effective ministry teams. The More Church Leaders, Stronger Church Leaders video toolkit helps clergy and lay leaders discover a more fruitful way of being in ministry together. Learn more and watch video previews at churchleadership.com slash shop. And remember to stay up to date with the latest church leadership strategies and information please like and subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon to get updates for new videos. How can church leaders improve their time management and maximize ministry? In this episode, we speak with Nicole Riley about time management, saying no, and prioritizing rest and Sabbath. Also, learn how digital resources can help you better manage your time. Welcome to Leading Ideas Talks, a podcast featuring thought leaders and innovative practitioners. I am Jessica Anschutz, the Assistant Director of the Lewis Center for Church Leadership, and I'm your host for this Leading Ideas Talk. Joining me is Reverend Nicole Riley, a United Methodist pastor with over 30 years of experience. She's the author of Expanding the Expedition Through Digital Ministry and is now serving as a clergy coach social media manager, and host of the Clergy Wellness Project. Thank you, Nicole, for taking time to speak with me today about time management and ministry. My pleasure. As you know from your experience in ministry, there is always more work to be done and to-do lists are ever growing. So how can church leaders better prioritize their work in the midst of those circumstances? Yeah, I I think first just it's hard, right? I mean, just the reality is, is that um, we are sent to do really tough work in usually challenging circumstances. So I think we have to ask ourselves early on, like what really matters to us? What's really important? What, uh, even what does success look like? You know, where do I want to be sitting Uh, at the end of my ministry, what do I want to have given my time to? I I think a lot of times we are um, people pleasers as clergy, and we set ourselves up just to react to what the needs are instead of taking a couple steps back and, you know, take that authority and look at our lives and our schedules and decide, how do I want to do this? How do I want to live this? You know, and I always thought about what gives me the most bang for my buck. You know, um, I felt in ministry sermons and staffing and leadership development and raising money, that those were the things that when I gave those my attention, things move forward. But I would imagine it would be different um, for everyone. And then I think it's also like, what are you going to say no to? And there's a lot of demand on clergy's time for things outside of their local church. The Oftentimes, if you're in United Methodist, the district and the conference wants a piece of your time as well. And I am not a big believer in um, serving at the district or conference level, uh, especially if you're trying to grow a church or you're um, a a mom or a dad who's got, you know, kids at home. There's just so much time and you have to decide, you know, what success looks like for you. I think that's, that's really important. And it's also, as you know, um, contention contextually specific as far yeah. as what's going on in, in your life um, and in the life of, of those around you. And what are the expectations, not only of um, the congregation, but judicatories and, and other community activities. In a podcast episode that you had, you talked about uh, the importance of identifying the North Star and I'd love for you to share with our listeners sort of what you mean by this and, yeah. and how you use the North Star to help you prioritize. 
Yeah. So the idea of the North Star is really a variation on Stephen Covey's idea of the big rocks. So he tells this classic story that's been told a million times since about how, you know, if you have rocks, big rocks, small rocks, sand and water, you got to put them in the jar in the right order or else you can't put them in. And um, for me, this idea that we have some guiding principles, we have a North Star in ministry, um, and knowing what our own North Star is, so we can put together our week in a way that actually uh, turns in that direction, lets us focus our attention there. You know, for me, the big rocks or my North Star were um, the sermon. The sermon was always a really important piece for me. Um, I would say uh, my staff and making sure that they had what they needed to be successful. That was one of my North Stars. And then sleeping, getting some sleep. <laughs> that was a North Star for me. And getting some exercise in. Um, those were things that if I was going to do anything in my week, these were the guiding things for my week. And I use this idea um, with my leaders as well, because I'd say, okay, so if you're going to um, take on leadership of this team, what are what's your North Star? What is it you want to accomplish? What is it you want to move toward? And them knowing that then help them feel more satisfied and successful. And um, I think those things lead to wellness more. Uh, I think a lot of times we get overwhelmed as clergy because we don't have a sense of where we want to go. And so we're just pushed and pulled in all kinds of directions. It's, it's so important to have the something to guide us, right? Yeah. That isn't just the latest phone call or email or person to drop by our office. I think that's really, really important. I, I, I love that you name sleep and exercise as North Stars, because yeah. I think so often those are things that church leaders will put off Yeah, because there are other things that they need to do. How can, how can we make sure that we have time for those things? Yeah, um, I think you have to just decide they're non-negotiable. You know, we, we are not machines. And if you want to uh, lead a church uh, into the future and you want to be around for 30 years or more, uh, there's certain things you just have to do that you have to do to take care of yourself. And I, I think a lot of times we think because we we care about community, we care about people, we want to move things forward. Um, we we don't prioritize these things, but they are so essential because if we don't prioritize them on the front end, we're going to deal with them at some point. And I always remember I went to um, worship one one uh, Sunday when I was on vacation and the pastor who was preaching was talking about some of his self-care. And he talked about he was a runner and um, what he did to take care of himself. And as I was sitting there on my vacation, I thought, you know, he looks very redeemed. <laughs> <laughs> He looks like, you know, he's living the the message of what this is about. And I thought I looked pretty discouraged and beat down. And so if I'm inviting people on the journey and and I'm not living the life that God calls me to, um, I don't know who wants to go with me. I mean, people aren't going to come to church because they want, you know, to give their money and have more stress. Right. right. So we need to look like <laughs> at least we're on the journey. We're not there. We haven't arrived, but we're on the journey. Absolutely. I love that. That we're and we're on the journey together. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if you want sleep, you should know that I want I want sleep, too, or time yeah. for rest and renewal. And I think it's so important, especially as we I mean, we're coming out of pandemic yeah. season where clergy were forced to pivot and change and adapt. And I'm hearing increasingly from folks who are, they're, they're tired, yeah. they're run down yeah. um, and exhausted. And 
increasingly we see clergy taking leave, renewal leaves and yeah. sabbaticals and things like that. So I think that's really, really a key to our success. It's really important. I grew up in a Roman Catholic family and my aunt was a nun and she was principal of a large Catholic high school and she had a rhythm of life. She lived, you know, she wasn't going 24 seven. She had times of retreat. She had times of vacation and it wasn't, you know, a day here or a day there. It was right. big chunks of time. Right. And she served, she went into ministry when she was like 17 years old and she died when she was 91 years old. And um, she li lived an active life, caring for God's people, but she had a rhythm of life that made that possible. What a powerful and example, a powerful example and a close example that you yeah. had in, yeah. in being able to witness her ministry. I want to go back to something you said earlier about sort of the power of saying no. Mm-hmm. And, and the importance of, of saying no as it, as it comes to time management. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think um, because we want to be helpful, because we want to move things forward, we, we often think that we can just jam one more thing in and keep saying yes. And also, I think we're, we're looking to contribute. You know, we have this sense that the church is in this big crisis a lot of times and you know, maybe we could help. And I, I, I think that there's going to be things you're going to want to do. There's going to be things you feel called to do. There's going to be things you're excited about doing, but just saying yes, because it feels like that's the thing to do. Isn't going to be down the road, the most helpful. I want to give my, I, I want to say yes to the things that let me give my gifts, the things that God has given me to help the body of Christ. But I think sometimes they're they're just trying to fill spots. You know, I've been on conference committees where I was not the right person. Um, I wasn't, it wasn't my passion. I wasn't super interested in it yet. It was taking, you know, four weekends a year and all kinds of time. And it just wasn't a good use of my time. It's hard to say no, you know, it, it lets people down sometimes when we say no. Um, so whenever I say no, I, I try to, you know, be thankful for the opportunity, but to be clear about, you know, that this wasn't the right time or this wasn't the right project for me. I think that that, that can help alleviate yeah. any, any guilt or, or stress that we feel. I know that sometimes when you say no, then they're like, well, if you won't do that, then how about this? Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're yeah, like, yeah. I still don't have time for that. <laughs> no, no, I think, you know, I, it, it's that take thou authority, right? You gotta, mm -hmm. you gotta be in charge of your own life. And, um, and I know that as pastors, a lot of times we, we have emergencies, we have people that we have to switch things around for. It happens all the time, but um, that doesn't mean we just live like that on that adrenaline rush. We have to we have to have some system, some ways of putting things together so that we we are saying yes to the things. There was that line about how the the good is the enemy of the best. And I think that's often true in ministry. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at what is the best for us. What is the best will always rise to the surface in any yeah. given point in, in time on the journey. One of the things we're seeing, you've alluded to the, the challenges that the church is facing today. And I would argue that the church is always facing challenges. Yes, they just absolutely. change over time. They do. Um, but increasingly we see a rising number of bivocational clergy. Yeah. And I think time management has to just be even harder for those who are trying to manage family and the potential of multiple jobs or vocations. So what words of wisdom do you have for those folks who find themselves in bivocational positions? Yeah. So I was bivocational for a while. I was doing house church planting, which was not funded. And then I was also pastoring a church. And um, so what was helpful to me and what I think is helpful in general is that communication right at the beginning, setting things up. So it, it's clear. What does it mean that I'm here 
50% time or 75% time? What does that actually mean as far as days you'll see me or sermons I'll preach or funerals I can do? I think a lot of times uh, there are too many of us who say, yeah, 50% salary, but we're still working 80 or 100% or even more time. Mm -hmm. And so really being very clear with either your DS or your HR or however it is in your system what that means, you know, to negotiate that and think about, you know, if I'm three quarter time, does that mean I'm preaching three weeks and one week I'm off completely? Or does that mean I'm working, you know, 30 hours a week, all weeks? I think that kind of clarity is really important. Um, I think also, I would just want to say, I think churches are way too dependent on clergy. And that is bad for the church, as well as bad for the clergy. Um, if clergy are the center of everything, that is not helpful. It's not helpful in the short term, and it's really not helpful in the long term. Um, I, I think of when I was, uh, when, when caller ID became a thing, that was like the best technology for me as a pastor, because I could be at home on a Saturday morning and I would see that really the same person every single week called me on Saturday morning. And I'd see her name there and I would just let it go to voicemail. She'd never leave a voicemail, but she was lonely on Saturday morning. She was a widow and she would just start calling down her list. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think knowing you know, what your parameters are for ministry, how much time you're giving, and then getting control of some of the tasks, whether that's pastoral care, how that's done, um, how that can be done in a, in a setting where you, I wish we just called it congregational care, because it's really not, <laughs> if I'm giving all the care, we're in trouble here, because I'm, <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, I'm first of all not wired in that way. I'm I'm wired um, differently, and so I'm not going to be the one who is going to be um, holding your hand and all of that all the time. But I'm going to raise up other people who will do that ministry because I think that that's a really important ministry. Um, I think one of the other a couple other things I would think of with bivocational ministry is if you are going to be the main preacher, getting a hold of that. And I think that you have to decide how much time you're going to give that and what are some ways you can cut down on the amount of time it takes. And I think working with other pastors is key here. So who are the other pastors who you can do a sermon series with? Um, who are the people who you say, okay, we're going to do a sermon series on hope. We're going to do four weeks. I have three other pastor friends who's writing the sermon for each of those weeks and how we're then going to customize whatever, you know, someone sends us the exegetical work or some illustrations or whatever. So I think it's how do we work together mm -hmm. so we're not just having to recreate the wheel all the time. And then I think also in, in pastor work in general, but I think probably especially in bivocational work, really looking at leaving some, I don't know, some squishy time or some open time for those emergencies. So you're not just packed with, I'm leading a Bible study and I'm preaching every week and I'm, you know, marrying, bearing, you know, what's the two to three hours that are squishy for whatever comes up. So you're not feeling so stressed out. I like that phrase, squishy time. <laughs> I, think we, I think we all, all need it. Yeah. I think it's huge because I think a lot of times we just pack our schedule with all the things instead of saying, you know, here's a couple hours here, here's a couple hours there. And these are times where if I need to deal with something, I can do it and I'm not feeling like angry or put out that now I'm going to have to work late, but I have some time built in for that. I think that's a very practical and, and useful, useful tip. As I, I think about our current digital age, and we learned a lot about remote work in the midst of the mm -hmm. pandemic and mm -hmm. doing ministry remotely or even in the hybrid context. How, 
how can we resource or utilize those resources, those digital resources um, to, to better manage our time? I think everyone needs a system. So one of the resources that I use is OmniFocus, which is a, um, a program that I use to put all of my tasks in and organize them. That's just been super helpful. Um, I would say also using something like uh, the pom Pomodoro technique, mm -hmm. which is a technique where you work for like standardly like 25 minutes and then you have five minutes off. Um, there's actually online, they have a website, I think it's pomofocus.io, and it is a, a timer that's right there. Mm -hmm. And what I like about it a lot is <laughs> I, you can set it up for different sounds. So I have like a ticking sound that goes like a clock, and that helps keep me focused. I usually do 50 minutes of focus and then 10 minutes off but you can do 25 minutes of focus and five minutes off, whatever works better for you. But I think that kind of a tool um, really helps. I would also say, you know, I, I know it might be uh, a little, a little controversial, but I think chat GPT is also a tool for ministry at this point. I use it for social media. So I use it to help me write posts for social media. I've also used it um, to do a sermon outline when I felt mm. particularly uninspired. <laughs> so I'm like, it's Transfiguration Sunday again. What do I do with that? <laughs> um, you know, so I can go to um, this AI function and say, give me a sermon outline on Transfiguration Sunday and how it relates to us today. And it was just, it was a game changer because <laughs> I just was like, oh, this is very interesting. This is very helpful. So um, I think it it can spark things. It can get us going. So some of these, whatever the tool, the technological tools that you use are, I think that they're, they're not to take the place of the human touch, but they are um, helpful in getting us going and getting, you know, getting, getting the fire lit as we move forward and doing things. I work at home now full-time as a clergy coach, but I will say that um, having a schedule is important, you know, when you start the day and when the day is over and even having a little end of the day ritual, because you can just take your laptop wherever you are. And it's <laughs> like, we need to close this now. And, you know, sometimes I will do 20 minutes of yoga at the end of my day, or I'll go for a five minute walk outside, just something to, to signal to myself that work is ended and now you can do other things. One of the things I always do in my scheduling of my week is I schedule rest in first. So every day I have a period of rest in some point in my day. Um, and at this point in um, my ministry, I'm able to take like 45 minutes and put my feet up, read a book or sit out in the garden or do something. And that that's part of the rhythm of the day, that there's that rest piece. And then there might be more work after that, or there might be um, other responsibilities after that. But um, just having some, some rest and having that as part of what I calendar. For folks who aren't calendaring rest, how would you encourage them to get started? Yeah. So I think first just kind of, being aware of what your calendar looks like first. I use a um, combination of electronic and paper. So I put everything on electronically and then I move things around so it makes sense for my week. And then I put that on my paper calendar um, with the tasks for the week. I'm looking at what have I been doing? How much have I been working? And where have I been wasting time? Because I think one of the things is that um, a lot of times we may not have a rest session on our calendar or a, or a break for even lunch and maybe eating, but we're scrolling social media, right? So our body's going to do what it's going to do. And if we can become more conscious of it and think, how much time did I spend on social media? How much time did I waste um, looking at things on Amazon um, instead of doing my work? And what if I built in a break? Would I do less of that? and have more time uh, that actually does renew me. And, and just to not feel like you're getting away with anything. I think sometimes we scroll on social media or we shop online 
um, as a way to care for ourselves because we feel like to actually say, I'm taking 30 minutes to put my feet up. We feel like we're getting away with something. And I just don't think that's true. <laughs> I think that's, we're not machines. We are actually human beings and we do need um, a better rhythm of life. What is a, a rhythm of life that's sustainable? Because clergy are dealing with terrible burnout and terrible exhaustion. And a lot of that just relates to the fact that we have terrible rhythms of life. You know, the whole scripture is around, you know, the, the, we have these 10 commandments that God has set up so that we live in a rhythm of life that is better, you know, that we have a Sabbath day uh, is related to the fact that we're not slaves. And, uh, you know, if you're a slave, you don't have Sabbath. If you're a slave, you don't take time off. We are not slaves. We are you know, we are free in Christ. And that is really an important piece of our identity as people of faith that, that our lives are enjoyable and wonderful and lovely. And we serve and we give and we do all the pieces. It's not an either or. Thank you for lifting that up and highlighting the importance of Sabbath in anticipation of talk in talking with you today. I um, talked with some of our seminarians, I'm at Wesley Theological Seminary, about sort of what questions they had related to time management. And one of the first things that came up was, how do you find time for Sabbath in the midst of all of the demands of ministry? It's the big rock. You put it in first. It's non-negotiable. It's so non-negotiable to God, it's one of the Ten Commandments, right? <laughs> so it's like, why is it we think? that somehow um, we're so busy or so central that we can't do it. So for me, um, a one day off or two days off has always been non-negotiable. Yeah, there may be, I may need to spend an hour here or an hour there. But in general, I always took Friday and Saturday off unless there were, you know, a wedding or a funeral on Saturday. I always took all my vacation, all my education time. And I think if you want to thrive in a 30 year career, you have to do those pieces. And other professions do do those pieces. They require these things. Um, and I think if you're, you're not sure how to start building in some of them in your church life, things like telling your church every month, I take a Wednesday and it's a day of prayer. And then spending the morning, you know, collecting, you know, people on Facebook will tell you how to pray for them. You do all of those pieces you pray for them and then you take the afternoon off or doing a quarterly retreat. I just came back from doing a three-day retreat and it was just, I rested, I read, I felt rejuvenated. Um, and then looking at, you know, is there a way you can take a, a day every other month for study, you know, an expend, extended time for study? Um, if you have to invest in yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to prioritize um, who you are and the gifts that God has given you. And you can't do these things if you don't take time off. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's just ridiculous when we when we treat ourselves that poorly. That does nothing. It does nothing for us. And it is bad for the churches we serve. Well, I am so enjoying this conversation, but I recognize that our time is rapidly drawing to a close. And I want to invite you to sort of reflect on your years of experience mm -hmm. and what you know now about time management and what you wish you had known when you started out in ministry. Yeah, I think at the beginning of ministry, I thought, you know, I could just... Um, work hard enough to move things forward. Um, and that if I just worked a little harder, things would, would come together more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I realized that um, that's not actually how this works. And that when I did that, it was a lack of faith on my part. Um, I have realized over the years that uh, I can't make other people happy in the local church that some people will be happy about the sermon on racism and some people will be unhappy about the sermon on racism. And as one friend said to me, if someone is going to be unhappy with my life, it's not going to be me. Right. So I'm going to do what I need to do um, in order to um, be successful in what matters to me in my life. 
Um, I think I served at the beginning of my ministry from too much anxiety. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I've learned to serve more out of joy and out of my gifts. And to be able to say, you know, I don't know how to do these things. I don't know what this is. And to pick up the phone and call people to get help. I think um, resourcing each other, not feeling. So I think as clergy, we often feel on our own. Um, and I've always been a meditator. I um, I grew up as Roman Catholic when I was uh, going to be confirmed. They taught us meditation and it really stuck with me. And I think um, there were periods of my life where I struggled the most in ministry with stress or anxiety were the times in my life that I was not living into a regular rhythm of prayer and meditation. Um, so I think looking at kind of, you know, looking back at 30 years, I feel like I've had lots of wonderful opportunities, um, served churches that were 60 all the way to 500 and have learned a lot over the years. If I could talk to the Nicole of 30 years ago, you know, I would definitely talk about um, focus on your own journey, um, on what matters to you. Um, focus on having more fun, on enjoying yourself a little more. Um, I have one son, I have one child, and he and I always had a great time together um, in ministry. I used to, when he was little, I would take him with me on some things. And and he always just, uh, you know, I think that's really served him well in his life, um, those experiences that we had. And that's something I feel like I did right. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think taking it down a notch would have been helpful. <laughs> would have been really helpful at some point. I think too many times I was just going, going, going. Um, but I, I think the uh, there's lots of opportunity in ministry. There's lots of possibilities, and our job is uh, to give out of our gifts, to serve in a way that that lights us up, um, to develop other people into leaders, to uh, help people on their walk of discipleship. And out of that, then God grows the church and God moves things forward. That's beautiful. And I hope more people will take that to heart. I want to thank you, Nicole, for taking the time to speak with us today, to reflect with us. And I want to remind our listeners that your book is Expanding the Expedition Through Digital Ministry and that your podcast is the Clergy Wellness Podcast. And I hope that folks will both check out your book and listen. Um, to thank you podcast. so much. I appreciate the opportunity to share. I think our clergy are our greatest resource and they need uh, time and attention and lots of love and encouragement in this season. I wholeheartedly agree with you. Uh, thanks again. Thanks for joining us for Leading Ideas Talks. Please like and subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon to get updates for new videos.